Good evening. I'm very happy to see you all here. I'm going to, there is a skill which is fundamental to our approach, and it is the skill of convincing parents, teachers, or whoever works with us to ask for support, to give support, and to get support. And it is a skill that can be learned. How do we know that it is a skill that can be learned? We know from experience that people who are young to NVR, who have just learned the method and still don't have a lot of experience in the first month when they are, for instance, at the Schneider uh, unit in, 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 in the in, uh, NVR Schneider unit, that the young therapists, they succeed. We have in our protocol a supporters meeting. One session of the therapy in which all the supporters come in. This is many times a, a longer session, one hour and a half. It's only one session, but it is an absolutely crucial session. After that session, okay, the group continues to be activated and utilized by mail, by phone, by requests from parents. But that's the founding event of the support group. And we know that young therapists have difficulty in convincing parents to bring in supporters. Young therapists may have supporters meeting in about 40% of their treatments. In 60%, they don't succeed in doing that. Experienced therapists, those who already have had, okay, have uh, won their gallons in NVR after a year even, they succeed already in having supporters meetings in more than three quarters of the cases. Okay, so that's something that has been learned. In addition to that, young therapists, in general, succeed in getting parents to bring a relatively small number of supporters, three people, sometimes four people. People who have already more experience and feel more sure of themselves in NVR succeed in getting people to bring eight, nine, ten, and also twenty supporters. So this can be learned. You get better at it. You create support, you stimulate, you convince people to bring supporters more in a more efficient way. In order to do, what are the elements of the skills? Okay? If we want to train people so that they become better able to do this, you have to define what are the elements of the skills. Okay, the first element is very interesting. It seems obvious. It's creating a good alliance with the parents themselves. Not everyone, first of all, in our profession, in our profession, we don't learn very well how to create good alliances with parents. Therapists, in general, are not good at that. Why is it that therapists, in general, are not good at that? Because our theories are not parent-friendly. Our theories explain very well how the parents did everything wrong. And when you start explaining, when you have a theory that explains why the parents did everything wrong, the parents feel accused. They feel blamed. Maybe they're already blaming themselves because they also believe in those theories. That's a very bad beginning for a therapeutic re relationship. Now, there are findings of what is the dropout rate in parent guidance programs. Very high. Parent guidance programs for ADHD have an average dropout rate, the best ones, an average okay, dropout rate of over 30%. That means more than 30% of the parents that begin the therapy, more than 60% uh, of the parents who come to the therapy do not finish the therapy. Sorry, the other way around. Only 60% will finish the therapy. With adolescents, it's even higher. 
the dropout rate of parents from treatments, coaching, guidance, training, parents of adolescents, is about 50%. We have a dropout rate of about 5%. It's absolutely okay, different, uncomparable. How do we do that? Okay, we establish an alliance with parents, first of all, by acknowledging, by empathizing with their achievements, with their efforts, with their dreams, with their efforts, and with their suffering. We have to be able to talk to parents about parental suffering. We don't learn how to talk to parents about parental suffering. We learn to talk to parents about child suffering. But it's the parents who are our clients. So we have to be able to talk to parents about parental suffering. Okay? Whoever speaks about with parents about filial ingratitude, okay? Child who are ungrateful. Do we use this kind of terminology in psychotherapy? Almost never. Why not? Ingratitude is a universal theme of all cultures. King Lear, one of the greatest tragedies of all world history, is about filial ingratitude. We all know about it. So many parents live it. Why is it that it is taboo to mention it? Why can you say, can't you say to parents, you know, your children are ungrateful. We have to think about ways of reacting to that. Okay? We don't have to blame them for that, but they are ungrateful, and you suffer ungratefulness. Do we dare to say that to parents? We don't dare to say that. But do we dare to say to parents, your children exploit you, you are exploited parents? We have to think about ways how you can protect yourself and how you can get, okay, create a situation in which you won't be. Do we dare to say that? Do we dare to say to parents, you are better parents? We don't. Those words are not in our vocabulary. Why not? Why not? Parental suffering is absolutely as legitimate as child suffering. We have to be able to talk about parental suffering in very clear, open, and honest terms. And it won't be blaming the child because we'll find ways to help the child, but we won't find ways to help the child if we cannot talk honestly with the parents, and the parents won't stay there if we don't talk honestly to them. So this is the beginning. We have to be able also, to speak to parents who are very difficult parents, who are violent, who are neglecting, we have also to be able to create an alliance with those parents. Okay, we don't create an alliance with those parents by simply okay, hiding the problems. No, we don't. But it is very important to recognize, to acknowledge the deep dreams that the parents certainly once had, the positive feelings that the parents certainly once had. We tell those very difficult parents, we are sure that deep in your heart, you have the best positive dreams and hopes about your child. That when your child was born, you wanted only the best in the world for him. And deep in your heart, you want it now. But things got out of hand. Life is complicated. Bad things happen to you and to your child. Very bad things happen. This is tragic. Those developments are tragic. But we believe that your deep positive feelings are still there. We believe that deep in your heart, you are loving parents deep in your heart. You haven't been able to manifest this in a very positive way. We think you can be helped and in order to be helped to do that, you also help, have to get help in protecting yourselves, in defending yourself, and also in defending your child, and in defending your other children, protecting you. Then what you get is something very interesting. You see the parents in, in front of you wakening up. You see their eyes opening. You see them saying, like, we, maybe there is something here which is different, because we are creating an alliance with them. We create an alliance with them when we talk to them about their achievements, about their efforts. Now, again, our theories, okay, what we learn is not geared 
to help us see parental achievements. We learn in the university how to see the parental flaws. But we don't see the parental achievements. How come we don't see the parental achievements? Very difficult, it's very interesting. Training, therapies, to see parental achievements is not a simple text at all. It takes time. Today we had a discussion, and the first acknowledgement that was given was foster parents. The first acknowledgement was beautiful. The first acknowledgement, okay, the first thing that, okay, you know, okay, the therapist, the, this person in the audience said, okay, Ofra Shacham, she said, you know, to the foster parents, you have succeeded in giving the child a place where when he comes home, there is food on the table. That's incredible, okay, it's so basic. When he comes home, there is food on the table. Is it obvious? Is it evident that when a child comes home, there is food on the table? No. You have to care for the child, you have to remember, and you have to prepare the food, and you have to put it on the table, and you have to know when the child is coming home. Okay, this is an achievement. It's not only an achievement, it's something that stays in the child's memory. Okay, we tend to think, okay, that's okay, self-evident. No, it's not self-evident at all. Okay, then there are other achievements that many times we tend to overlook them. Like for instance, the achievement, you took care that your child, child goes to school every day. That's an achievement. Many times we think, well, those parents only care for the child that he succeeds as a student. He doesn't care for his soul, for his feeling. No, it's an achievement. It's not obvious. It's not self-evident. You care for the fact that the child is dressed, that he has a sweater on it, incredible. Is that an achievement? Yes, caring for that is an achievement. But there are many more achievements. Okay? And if we look for them, we'll see. And when you say them for those parents who feel, they feel such complete failures, and you take the care to look for the achievements, say, no, those things are not obvious. And then you find also the emotional achievements. Okay, for the case, in the case of this uh, foster parents who feel completely frustrated, okay, we were able to get one acknowledgement that was given to them. You know, for two years, this child had one stable home, one stable house, one stable place. There were rules, there was food. This will stay in his head, like a piece of order in the future. This is an acknowledgement. And then these foster parents will be attentive to us. We're not used to that. And values and dreams. Parents' dreams are very important. You always wanted your son to be something. You always believed your daughter should be someone. You always hoped she would be a distinguished, whatever, dancer, violin player, football player, good student. Those dreams are vital. There was one time in psychology when those dreams were prescribed. Narcissistic parents, we all know how many books were written about those are narcissistic parents that project their dreams of the, over their child. Look, if we don't dream about our, our child, we have no hope at all. If we don't have dreams about our children, if we don't think about them as successful, as glowing, as beautiful, as wonderful, as the best, they don't have hope at all. How comes we reached such a situation in our profession that parental dreams have been prescribed, narcissistic parental dreams that are imposed on the child? That's absurd. We have reached such levels of, okay, we have lost contact with the basics of life with the basics of parenting. So we have 5% dropout rate, because we talk to parents like that. There are other reasons. We have 5% dropout rate, because we also get the parents to receive support. They feel less alone. Maybe they feel less alone than ever. That reduces the drop, that people who feel less alone because we're helping them to feel less alone, start valuing what we do. And there is the third reason. The third reason, 
is that we get them to do things that they didn't believe they would be able to do. Okay, this is a very action-oriented approach. When we get a parent to do something that says, I wouldn't have believed this would have been possible for me, we have an alliance. He says, I'll stay here. They have a surprise. Something happens to them. Even when they make an announcement, you know, the first step in a NVR therapy is making an announcement. What percentage of parents can make an announcement? Almost all, 99%. It's very easy, okay, if you give them the, if you follow them up, and again, they, they make the announcement and they say, how did I do that? I can't believe, I never was so clear before. I dared to get into the lion's den, the room of the child, and tell him the announcement and give it in writing. Incredible, I did that, you know, doing something like that that you didn't believe that you would be, that makes you something. And the moment you succeed in getting the parents to recruit supporters, that's amazing. <coughs> then they feel that they have done something which for them was virtually impossible. But it is difficult to convince them to. When it happens, it is the greatest thing in the treatment. That's the greatest moment in the treatment. Supporters meeting are the most beautiful moments in the treatment. Okay, so that I wish all of you to be able to recruit supporters with families and to conduct supporters' meetings. Because afterwards, the situation is never again the same. We have gotten rid of the secret. We have reduced isolation. We have completely new options. We can deal with all kinds of difficult situations with which we could not deal before. But to get there, it's complicated. Why is it complicated? Even many times we mention this idea of supporters for the parents, and we have all kinds of difficulties, all kinds of objections. The parents who come to the second session and say, look, we like this idea of the treatment very much, only one part we don't like, this idea with the supporters, we don't want, that's not good for us. Teachers. Okay, we come to teachers and we say, we have to create support between teachers and between teachers and parents. That means teachers must become able to come up with their problems and say, I have this problem and this problem with this child. Okay, what do you think about it? Do you also have such a problem? Teachers feel very bad about it. If I do that, it will mean that I failed. Okay, so teachers also have this difficulty of coming out. And we succeed, and as I said, we can learn we succeed in doing this better and better with more and more parents, and we can learn that. In order to do that, first of all, we have to know the objections. We have to have a map of the parental objections against support, against the idea of supporters in our head. So we are not surprised, because so is a number of objection, objections that keep coming back again and again and again. We must be prepared for them. We must know them. Where is the... How do I get there? Okay, I go here. Okay. First objection, we call it the privacy reflex. It's a, an objection of parents, of teachers, and many times of therapists also. We are also, okay, caught by this privacy reflex. What is this privacy reflex? It is the tendency to prefer to solve problems in a complete private way, in an intimate way, in a secret way, in a discreet way. And this is a reflex. What do I mean it's a reflex? We don't even think that we have this preference. It is so automatic. And also, okay, parents come and say, of course, we have to solve them. This is our problem. This is our child's problem. What do the other people have to do with it? It's not their problem. It's our problem. So the privacy reflex is the tendency you're keeping within the bubble. We therapists are deep believers in the privacy reflex. We almost, we are one of the developers of the privacy 
reflex. We have invented the ultimate privacy bubble, the psychotherapy room. You see, the psychotherapy room is a total bubble. You know, we, when we learn uh, child therapies, that learns to do therapy, one of the first things that he learns is to tell the child that comes to him, you know, this is your hour. It belongs to you. Nothing that happens in this room will go to anybody else. Nobody will know. Only I and you will know. Comes a child, eight years old, he doesn't even know what this woman or this man is talking about. <laughs> Has no idea. An adolescent knows and understands and values it. But is it right to begin it like that with an adolescent? Okay, we take it as an absolute given, of course, otherwise he won't open up, he won't talk. Why would it be a bad idea to start a therapy, okay, either with children or the adolescents, and tell them, we're going to talk and I want to talk to you about the things that bother you, but you know I talk to your parents also. Why? Because they are your parents. And they also have to know how best to help you. But if there is something that you would like me not to tell your parents, then tell me, please. Tell me, and if it is possible, I'll respect it. What is it? We are giving the opportunity of opening up a private space, but we are not creating a bubble, an isolated bubble. That's absurd. Why do parents leave child therapy, because they believe that they are kept out. They are left out. If they are left out, why should they stay there? Why should they stay? It's very interesting. We don't, we're not aware of this. This is the privacy reflex. How do we deal with it? We have knowing this, that this will come, and they all have this reflex. They prefer not to. Let's keep it to ourselves. Also teachers. Okay, a teacher has a violent child in class. Very often, he'll prefer at the end of class, he talks to the child and says, let's make an agreement between you and me. Huh? You do this and I do this, and then we have an agreement, everything will be okay. Your parents won't know, they don't have to do it. It's a deep, deep, deep mistake, okay? A very deep mistake. It destroys not only okay, the, 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 the possibility of really treating the problem, it destroys also the credibility of the teacher before the class because the teacher is the leader of this class. And if she doesn't show that it take cares, take care of all violence in the class, she'll lose her leadership place completely because the children will say she, she does not protect us. Okay, it's very interesting. The privacy reflex prevents the basic rule of treating violence. And that's what we do because we want to be discreet. That's the privacy reflex. Or I'll give you an example. Many people hear about children, adolescents, that make threats of suicide. Okay, many make threats of suicide okay, in the heat of a fight. If you do that, I'll kill myself, or you'll never hear from myself, or more roundabout ways. When this happens, do we, as therapists, involve other people? It's a threat of suicide. Do we involve, or by adolescents, he said, do we involve other people? Do we say, no, no, this is, okay, now he's threatening to hurt himself, herself. Do we involve other people? No, we don't. Because the threat of suicide is considered a very intimate matter, intimate. Intimate means enclosed, potentially shameful. Intimate, you keep it secret. It belongs in the therapy. It does not belong in the world. But a, so a suicide threat is the most violent threat in existence. It's a, an act of potential, absolute destructive potential. Because the child is threatening not only to destroy his life, but also the life of his parents and of most of his family. With one act, there is the, the no acts that are more destructive okay, than suicide. 
And do we involve other people? No, it belongs in the intimate. It's incredible. We don't have procedures. We do. Okay, we develop. Okay, but there are no in the literature. You don't have procedures for involving other people. Maybe the psychiatrist. Maybe in hospitalizing the child. No, there are many other possibilities. Many other possibilities of de dealing in, okay, in a support group with suicide threats. When the grandmother and the uncle come to this adolescent and said, okay, we've heard that you've threatened to hurt yourself, and says, who told you? Your parents, of course, but you know, how could it be otherwise? Your life is the most important thing for us. And we'll do everything in our power to help you, not to do that. What have we done? We have created, instead of a bubble, a protective ring. We have changed the ecology of the suicide threat. We have done it dozens of times. Dozens of times. Okay, we have done it in extremely critical situations. We've had a case of a girl who tried to hang herself, 15-year-old girl. Not only the grandparents came in and begged for her life, but also her 12-year-old brother came in and begged for her life. And she hugged him. And she cried, and she promised to him she would never do that again. This goes against the privacy reflex. This goes against the intimacy reflex. Okay? Completely different idea. Then there are other ways we convince parents to overcome the privacy reflex. We convince them that it is not such a good idea to keep those things enclosed, hermetic, within the bubble. We tell them. Like, for instance, in cases of violent children, or in cases in which the situation between parents and child escalate very much. We tell them, look, we understand that you want to solve this problem alone, but it is not a good idea. It is a bad idea. Why? Because so long as you are alone, you'll be weak and vulnerable. When he attacks you, you are alone, you feel that you are against the wall, that you are under terrible pressure. And when you are against the wall, when you are on the ropes, you have either two possibilities. You either give in or you hit back. And those are very bad possibilities. In order not to be pressed against the wall, not to be pushed against the corner. You have to get broader. You have to get wider shoulders protected, and you're not pushed against that. You don't have to give in, and you don't have to hit back. Then there is another reason. You know, so long as you are only you and the child, it's a very it's like a clockwork that is very much together. Okay? All the different teeth of this clockwork are enmeshed with each other. And then he does the, this and you do this, because that's how it is. Tick tock, tick tock. You're so, the moment other people come in, the meshes, because there are other people here, it's not only you that react, it's not react, 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 react. There's more space, so you should bring other people here. So you don't overreact, you don't react automatically. What is an intimate relationship? Now, an intimate relationship is a relationship in which we shed our resistance. There's nothing. Okay? We peel ourselves from all our protective layers. So we are unprotected. So the child, when he hurts us, he hurts us very much because the relationship is so close. And then we bring in other people. There's also the uncle, there's the aunt, sometimes there's the neighbor. We're in a different situation. We are convincing the parents to shed their privacy reflex. And they're beginning to listen to us. They're getting interested. Okay, and this conversation continues, and we get a, another objection. Shame. 
The child, child will feel terrible shame. They also feel shame, but the child will feel will have a trauma. Okay, it will be traumatic shame. If we expose him to others, that's the, he will simply collapse. He won't be able to bear. It will be destructive, traumatic. We have to know this objection. We must be ready to hear it, even sometimes to detect it because the parents sometimes don't say it. They only okay, indicate it, and we have to see they're very much afraid, extremely afraid, that the child will experience shame. And then we can ask them, if we expect this, if we know this objection, if we have it in our mental map, we can ask them and tell me, you think the shame would be so bad? And then the parents who have, oh, yes, it would be terrible. Be terrible. Shame. It's a very bad feeling. Yeah, but we are prepared. If we are prepared to that, we can tell the parents, you know, shame is a very unpleasant feeling. But it is not always a bad feeling. Sometimes it is a necessary feeling. Okay, we know, for instance, from research, criminological research, of a violent adolescence, that those are adolescents who haven't learned to withstand shame because they didn't experience shame in a positive context. What does it mean, experiencing shame in a positive context? If you experience shame in a context in which the people say, it's true, Okay, we can't accept what you're doing. This is violence, what you're doing to your sister. Or you cannot steal money from your parents. Shame. But we care for you. Uncle, grandma, we care for you. We love you. Okay, this is the first positive context. Not only that. We believe you can overcome that. You can overcome the violence. You can overcome the urge to steal. We assure you can. We trust that you can do it. We believe in you. This is the second element of support. And then there's a third element of support. We are willing to help you. If you call us, we'll find ways for you to overcome this difficulty, to solve your difficulties with your sister without, without coming to blows. We'll help you. You can call me any time of the day or the night. Fantastic support. So the child experiences shame. What you're doing to your sister is unacceptable. You're beating her up. And you forgot one thing. I'm not only your grandmother, I'm also his grandmother or her grandmother, okay, your sister. So I have to protect you both, and I won't accept that you beat up my grandchild. You, my grandchild, won't beat up my other grandchild. I love you, I believe in you, and I want to help you, but this cannot help any, happen anymore. What is happening here? The child is experiencing shame in a highly positive context, in a highly embracing context. He is experiencing constructive shame. Shame that will produce positive development. We tell this to the parents, and you tell them, when we constitute the support group, we will help all the supporters. We will instruct them. We will coach them to talk like this to your child. Suddenly, shame is less and less of an issue. Is it so? How can you guarantee? Maybe he'll be very angry. Yeah, maybe he'll be angry, but he'll get enough support to be able to withstand that anger. Okay? We are dealing with this objection. And when we deal with this objection, we're also dealing with the parent's own shame. It's very interesting. The best way to deal with the parent's shame is to talk about the child's shame. And then, okay, we are always, can expect always these objections because they always keep coming back. Isolation. They say, we have no one. We have no supporters. There's nobody around. You're isolated. We hear that so much because most people feel very, very isolated. But you know, isolation 
is not only an objective condition, it is also a mentality. It is also a habit. People develop a mentality of isolation, among others, because they don't have the experience that they can get help, that if they ask for help, help may be forthcoming. So isolation may be a mentality. When they say, we don't have anybody, okay, I, he, I hear that every week from parents. We don't have anybody. There is nobody. I say, let's see. Okay, I understand that you feel very much alone, very much isolated. Let's see. Are there grandparents? Then we often get, yes, but they're old, they're worried, they're sick. We don't want to bother them. Yeah, but they care for your child. Yes, they care very much, but they're old and sick, and we don't want to bother them, don't want to make them suffer. I said, look, they are the child's grandparents. If you tell them, they will They'll feel sorry for the child, and maybe they'll feel sorrow. But they'll feel good that you're telling them, that you're trusting them. They'll feel good that they can be of some help for their grandchild. We've had cases of grandparents who were ill in bed, and they became fantastic supporters by phone of the child, and they got a lot of meaning for themselves of the fact that every day they had a phone conversation with their grandchild. They're already sick, waiting for death sometimes. Sometimes even a hospice with terminal disease. They started calling their grandchild every day. You know what's the meaning of a child, an adolescent, who suddenly starts getting daily calls from his grandmother in a hospice, caring about him, asking about him, talking to him, being interesting, being updated, it's an enormous impact. And we had it quite a few times, this kind of experience. Or another answer, no, but they are far away. They're in another country. This is a very common situation. Far away, for don't you have telephone contact, Skype contact? Lots of help can come through telephone, through Skype, from other countries. The strangest support group we have ever had was the support group of two Sicilian parents and uh, their child widow who had to run away from Sicily to Germany because there was a contract on the father to kill the father. They were mafia people. So they had to they get asylum in Germany. They got asylum in Germany, Sicilian people, and after six months, child in kindergarten becomes so violent in the kindergarten that the parents of the other children in the kindergarten are making demonstrations to kick the child out of the kindergarten. How do we do now? They're alone, they're Sicilians, don't know German. What kind of support system can we build for them? This is real isolation, isn't it? Complete isolation, the isolation of ma mafia people with a contract on their heads. Is there more isolation than that? The support system was built out of the family in Sicily, of the men of the family in Sicily. Grandfather, who was a mafia boss, and two uncles, who were mafia people, and they would call this Guido every day and would call him and tell him, Guido, you have to understand that you cannot beat the other children in the kindergarten because you are guests in Germany. If you're guests in Germany and you beat the people that, then you dirty the name of your father and your grandfather and your uncle of the whole family. Do you want to dirty our name? You cannot dirty our name. So Guido, you don't beat these children anymore and we'll talk about you every day. When you come here on vacation, it's another story. Okay, so we get a support system of the most absurd kind, and it was effective. Okay, so that uh, isolation. We get people to help. Sometimes isolation, the, sometimes one of the important ways 
of getting parents out of the isolation is connecting them to other parents with similar problems. Okay, we have people, okay, there's a whole program in England, Elizabeth Eisman and uh, some, uh, some of the mothers come in every conference. We have some of the mothers, they give each other support. Okay? This is, but it's also important to have support from the natural surroundings, not only from the therapy group. This is fantastic, but also from the natural, and we get. So we have an answer to isolation. In our mental map, we have isolation as well. Then we have asking for help means I am weak. This is a very common objection. Teachers, universal. If I ask for help, it means I am weak. Okay? And children reinforce it. You say, what? Okay? You don't have to calc the courage to deal with that alone? You're such a coward that you go and you run to auntie to tell what I'm doing. And okay, then the mother feels very bad about it because she feels that she's weak. She said, no, if we do that, if we call for help, that means that I'm weak. Well, it's true. You are weak from the point of view of naked force. You don't have this might to tell the child, you stop that. Okay, that kind of, that's right. From that respect, you are weak. Okay, but that's not the kind of strength that we want to promote in any case. Okay, not at all. And I say, but you know, there's another strength. This kind of strength you don't have. And you know, I'm very happy that you don't have it. Okay, we're very glad, the teachers, we are glad that you don't have that strength. But you can have another kind of strength. When other pop people come in, uncle, aunt, neighbor, and other people come in, and talk to your child and say, yeah, you're right. The mother is right. She cannot accept that you do this. A child is vanishing, an adolescent is vanishing from house every night. Mother starts doing a telephone round. Okay? This is a very powerful measure okay, of vigilant care, the telephone round. Okay? We've described it in various books. Okay? Mother does that, and the child says, what are you doing? You are destroying my social life. You know, you're destroying my social life that she calls him in different places. We call that adolescent propaganda, destroying my social life, not destroying nobody's social life. Then comes the uncle and the grandfather and says, but tell me, you're so angry that your mother calls you when you disappear. What, should she give you up? That's what you want. She gives you up. No, she is there and whatever it is. It's okay. Do you want her to give you? She cannot. And you know what? We cannot give you up too. So we'll have to help her do this. You know what you're getting without the parents? Very wide shoulders. You get legitimacy. You begin to sound like a we. And this is very strong. You know they understand this. And they stop wanting that kind of might and wanting instead this kind of strength. They enjoy it. Teachers, when they describe this, they get full of this wider presence, of this social presence. But you must expect that objection. It must be in your map. It must be there and you expect it to come and say, look, it is true. It doesn't make you strong in this thing. What do you mean? No, no, no. And we also don't want that. But it makes you strong in another sense. Deeper. Much more positive. And you know what? Much stronger. In the end, we can say, okay, not only that you don't get weak if you do that, you get much stronger than you would get by raising your fist or much stronger, and that's true. Okay? They become, because legitimate strength is something completely different from naked force, from the naked force of mind. Then another objection, which is very common, it's always there, not only very common, it's always there. Parents are very much afraid of the child's reactions very much afraid that the child will get wild, will hate them, will collapse, will try to kill himself, will run away from the house, will have a psychotic outbreak. They have, and the fears are always, always there. Okay, I tell you, it's so important to have this map in this because 
always, the parents are always afraid of getting help, disclosing the problems they have the child because they're afraid of the child's reactions. So we much, much, must expect that and we must be able to help the parents say, let's see what are the child's reactions that you fear. We have to be open about it. We have to be serious about it. And then the parents start telling, we're afraid that he'll run away from home and we won't see him for three days or for the whole week or we disappear. Well, we tell the parents, we have to get ready to face them and to overcome that. And we have good plans for dealing either with threats that the child will run away or for demonstrative attempt of running away or for real attempt of running away. And the parents then say, oh, that's true. We can get all the phone numbers of his friends. We can know where he spends his time. Prepare for a telephone round. Prepare for doing an active search for the child. And then they become more courageous because they know now how to do it. Or they're afraid that the child will break down, will collapse. Then we can tell, why should he collapse? Because he won't be able to contain his anger. Look, we are creating a support system. His grandma will stay with him for three hours, and afterwards, well, the uncle will come, and the brother, and, and they will stay with him. Do children collapse when we bring in support groups? On the contrary. On the contrary, they get angry and they get supported. Instead of collapsing, they become angry supported children. Very good. Angry supported children are a very good phenomenon. Very different from okay, collapsing. And, oh, that's what it, angry is not so bad. But angry supported is wonderful. Suddenly everything changes there in that, in that context. Then there's a fear of the other mother. He may kill himself. It's interesting. When we do supporters meetings, that we can, many cases, there will be someone who says, but how can you be sure that the child won't attempt suicide? So we must be ready. This time the objection doesn't come from the parents, it comes from one that support. Very, very frequent. How can you be sure that the child won't attempt suicide? Then we start, we ask the parents, are there any fears? As he mentioned, had he tried before? We bring it to the fore. Let's see, let's, let's talk about it openly. Let's talk about it openly. And then we tell this person and the parents the best way to deal with the anxiety about suicide is to create a support system, okay? is to be with the finger on the pulse. And then if there is any threat, somebody comes in and sits with the child. We have even an image. The parents imagine that the child is wandering on the verge of a precipice, of an abyss. He's there walking just on the verge of the precipice. And they have the feeling that if they do something, the child will jump over the precipice. And we tell them, you know, the two factors that increase the danger of your child, two vital factors, the two vital factors are Loneliness and despair. Loneliness is the feeling that there is nobody with him in those situations of danger. And despair is the feeling that no, there's no help. There's no alternative. So loneliness and despair, they're linked closely together. Now you create a support system. You are a fear of suicide. You're afraid of the threats of suicide. You're afraid that he's on the verge of the super. Of, the, of the, this precipice. And then somebody comes in, somebody who cares for the child and who the child still has some relationship to. They come in and they enter his room. What happens now? This person enters his room. He's angry. What are you doing here? He's angry. But when you are angry, you're not looking at the precipice. You're looking at the person who's making you angry. You know, you were there over the president. And suddenly you go, what are you doing here? 
You see, it's a very interesting change of position. And we tell that those to the parents and to the people in the group. And then they say, I'm here to be with you because I know that you're suffering. And I'll do everything to help you. I don't want any help, but still. Okay, also, if you don't any help, your help, I want to help you because I love you. They have this discussion, okay? I'll love you, if you even if you don't want me to love you, okay? They say you can scream at the child. I'll love you even if you don't want me to love. But he would, in this situation, nobody jumps into the... Can, can you imagine? That's a completely crazy react. But then you are already there. If already there, you can hug him. You can hold him. He won't jump. See, the dynamics of impulsive action is the contrary of what the parents imagine. So we see we prepare parents for the possible reactions of the child. How long do I have anymore? Three minutes. <laughs> okay. Fear to stigmatize or damage. Okay, I'll do, I'll do another thing. I'll finish it with a, another point. When you create a support system, what is the signal, what is the sign of a good support system? Okay, there is something that is the sign of the good support system. The sign of the good support system is that it creates an invitation for the child to belong. That means it is not a support system in which the child is kept outside. It's a support chill, it's a system that invites the child constantly to belong. There are messages that we have created those messages of an invitation to belong, okay? There are many things, okay? Those we are not going to do, <laughs> okay? Okay, expressions that we have devised, parents of boycotting children, children who boycott one of the parents. How can you create, give messages that encourage the child to belong, that like they enter the deep need every child has a very deep need to belong. So you have to, to, to create, to stimulate that need. I'm your father and will always be your father. I'll do all I can in order to help you. Those are messages that parents, boycotted parents or sometimes parents who the other parent was boycotted. If you get into trouble, I stay by your side. Deep in my heart, I believe that if I or grandma were in danger, you would come to rescue, just as we would do if you were in danger. What will the child say? No, I won't come to your rescue. No child was born who will react in this way. Okay? There isn't. There isn't such a thing. Pride. You know, the child is a difficult child. The father says to him, I'm proud of your staying power. Or even, even when you fight with me, I admire your strength and endurance. Child may say, bah! but he heard it. He heard it, okay, and he can put it in writing also. The better. I'll do all I can to give you the feeling that you have a family, a place, a home. I believe that deep in the heart of everyone in this family, there is a feeling of one for all and all for one, the three musketeers. I believe that if one of us were really in danger, you would show what you are worth. Okay, we are appealing to the child's wish, desire to belong. I believe in you. I believe in your capability of overcoming difficulties. Another invitation to belong is to acknowledge past mistakes. I know that the fights between me and your mother caused you very deep pain. I'll do the best I can to repair those ills. Many times parents have first to become a little stronger in order to be able to make such an acknowledgement. Look, these are also invitations to belong. No one can force you to speak with your mother. No one can force you. It's very, that means there is no competition, no attempt to manipulate you. No one can force you to feel that you belong. Inviting means no one can force you. Maybe even if you can change the problem yet, maybe even you can change the problem yet, because you perhaps feel you're showing weakness. And you give this message, maybe tomorrow he can. Maybe it will take a long time for you to feel there's a possibility of changing the situation, or giving the child time, or giving him leeway. Maybe you feel cornered and feel you have no options. Those are all invitations to belong. Actually, there's a whole strategy. When we create support groups, 
The whole support group develops a strategy that is an invitation to the child to belong. You know, adolescents that go to a gang. Adolescents that go to a gang, it's because they feel very deep need to belong. And they feel that their isolated parents, their weak parents, are not people that they want to belong to because they're so weak. Okay? Once there was an adolescent that insulted his mother, okay, a, a, a mother alone, no father, insulted, humiliated the mother. Okay? And the mother once complained to him, you know, you don't even want me to kiss you. And he says, you to kiss me? Who wants to be kissed by a garbage can? That's what the adolescent says. So long as she remains a garbage can, he doesn't want to be kissed by her. He, won't want, he doesn't want to belong to a mother who's a garbage can. The moment the mother stops being a garbage can, the moment there is a whole village around her, this village is worth belonging to. So the whole idea of the support system receives part of its value from the fact that it is a standing invitation for the child to belong. Thank you very much.